I guess you should say that in ESOC, we are a group of interdisciplinary scientists who, who um, study in large part how human beings interact with the earth, largely using um, remote, advanced remote sensing techniques. Um, this is just a subsample of the people who've worked on this, the most significant con contributors to the work I'm gonna show you today. Um, but uh, Center itself consists of um, a number of other, um, both faculty, fellows, researchers from series, and a large cadre of postdocs, which is something that I've spent some time cultivating. And of course, all the graduate students that um, do most of the work that we do. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit though about a, a particular um, uh, area of research that is, involves the intersection of, again, big remote sensing data, um, what's called SAR data, synthetic aperture radar data, along with um, uh, advancing, advanced computational techniques that we hope to use for machine learning. And I'll be honest, we're just starting that phase of the work. So that's not, um, there's not a lot of that in here. The title is slightly um, misleading that way, but I'm gonna hopefully show you some interesting um, applications and advancements we've made to try and um, speed up this big data problem. So I'm gonna start with some basics. I'm gonna to talk to you about um, uh, DNSAR, Differential Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. It's a particular kind of SAR application. I'm going to talk about the challenges with that and uh, some of the recent advancements in satellite um, technology that have, that have helped um, alleviate a number of the issues that um, originally were associated with SAR in SAR applications. But um, that, of course, leads to new challenges, which in this case are largely the big data ones. So I'm gonna to talk to you about that. And then I'm gonna um, show you some results from some of the stuff we've done around the world in different places, different applications, and talk a little bit about future work. So let's um, just briefly, I'm gonna give you a very short overview of INSAR. So uh, first INSAR applications were developed using the, um, using both originally SIRS-C data um, and then eventually shuttle radar topography mission data, uh, SAR that was acquired from the nose cone of the shuttle in the early 90s. And those original applications were, um, the, as a matter of fact, those, um, uh, those sensors were put on the shuttle for topography. INSAR itself can be used to create high relatively Nowadays we do it much in much higher resolution, but in those days, what was high resolution DEMs around the world using synthetic aperture radar data. And um, that data, uh, those original, um, uh, those original SRTM DEMs were incredibly valuable to the, to the scientific community around the world. They were at 90 meter resolution. The first ones were not released worldwide for free but eventually NASA, NASA did in the early 2000s. Um, they have since over the years worked at improving the resolution on those and um, uh, you can acquire them nowadays at 30 meter worldwide and 10 meter in the US, although that 10 meter data is augmented in some ways. Um, differential INSAR is, um, is an advancement on that original interferometric technique for producing topography. The idea is that if you take, so, so the topography was done by taking two images at the same point in time, again, two different radars on the, on the um, nose cone of the shuttle, and by taking the interferometric phase between them and knowing the baseline between those sensors, you could estimate the topographic height on the Earth. If, however, you then fly again over the same place in time, and there is some event that's happened, that has caused the Earth's surface to go up and down, you can create another interferogram between those two time passes, pass one and pass two in this figure. If there's been deformation between them and you remove the topography, you can see the phase change from that height change. Basically, there's a difference in those two topographic heights. You remove the topography and all you're left with is the height change. That shows up as a phase shift or an interferometric map. And um, that 
be used to tell you how much the ground moved during that. And largely the first two, um, uh, the first two um, examples of this, first two times that this, these, these were acquired was the Landers earthquake in 1992. So a big earthquake in Eastern California where the ground had very little vegetation and was dry. And there was a lot of motion on the ground and uh, you could, they produced this beautiful map. Also, Mount Etna happened to erupt during the time that the shuttle radar was overflying um, at, at that time. And they acquired images that, in which they could look at the expansion and actually in this case, the, the subsidence of Etna after it erupted. So the pre-image was, 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 was during eruption, the post-image was after eruption and they, they, they could map the subsidence as the magma chamber went down. You'll notice I have a volcano in the back here. That's Mount St. Helens. And that's because I am going to talk a fair amount about volcanoes today. This technology has been used um, in a lot of different volcanoes, particularly ones with low vegetation. So you get this map. You, get, you take two images from different times, you align them, and you compute the phase difference between each pixel. If the ground has moved, then that phase difference will correspond to the height in the line of sight, to the motion in the line of sight that the ground shifted. Again, it's related, that phase change is related to change in height of the Earth's surface. And now you can get this in a field. So GPS will, in theory, do the same thing for you, but GPS is a point measurement. You can get an entire field on the Earth. Today we have what we call, I'll give you some examples of this, and you'll see some pictures of it, but just to sort of um, I'll give you a preliminary view of why this matters, why this is a big data problem today. Back in those days, it seemed like big data, but we were really looking at basically three images you had to work with, pre, post, and the topography. Nowadays, we collect with Sentinel-1 A and B, which launched in 2014, two satellites, freely available C-band images collected over most of the world at either six or 12 day intervals. These are 100 kilometer swaths at two by seven meter resolution. These are very big data sets, which if you want to produce not just a single pass, not just a one time image, one time step image of what happened. If you want to produce a time series, you're looking at working with lots of data. ALOS 2 was launched and also in 2014. It provides high resolution data at three to 10 meters at what's called the L-band wavelength, which is a longer wavelength than C-band. Um, again, so recently it's not been freely available to the scientific community, but JAXA, that would be the Japanese Space Agency, has recently agreed to release its Scansar archive to the research community through the Alaskan Satellite Facility. NISAR is coming up. The launch date is not January of 2023 anymore. It's been pushed out again, um, probably till the fall. We'll see. Um, but NASA is a joint operation between NASA and the Indian Space Agency, Israel, that will provide global coverage again at both L-band and S-band. So, and again, global coverage, comparable resolutions. Every eight days or so, we're looking at, again, unprecedented high quality dense time series with using these DNSAR images. This on the left is an example of one of those interferograms. This is the Ridgecrest earthquake in July 5th of 2019. It's an unwrapped interferogram because this is, a, this is from Sentinel and it's a C-band satellite. Every fringe repeat here, every time you go from pink to pink or blue to blue or yellow to yellow, you have a 2.8 centimeter amount of motion in the line of sight direction. This is wrapped. You have to unwrap these in order to get absolute motion. And that absolute motion will actually be relative to the point you unwrapped from. So again, it's a relative motion image across, a relative motion measurement across the image. And in this particular case, it's at about 25 meters resolution. This was in, again, um, Eastern California, the Northern Mojave, North of the Mojave Desert. It's um, very dry, very low vegetation. You can see the beautiful pixel coverage. I did this, this is the earthquake itself was on July 5th of 2019. The, the time span is a single look, this is a single set of passes. Pass one was on June 28th, pass two was on July 10th. And this is the difference in motion between June 28th and July 10th caused by that earthquake. Um, I, I did this a couple of weeks later. Um, took me a couple hours on my, once I set it up on my local machine. 
Those shorter repeat times here though, that 12 day repeat time makes a huge difference when you want to start looking at processes with either processes in areas with lots of vegetation or a lot of time change or smaller motions. Again, in the case of the Ridgecrest earthquake, we're talking tens to hundreds of centimeters of motion in the end at the, at the fault surface. In older satellite, in processes with smaller signals, you're gonna to need to accrue motion over time in order to see that, to see motion. So you're gonna to have to have a time series. In addition, the older satellites only acquired data at one month at best. And you were lucky to be honest with you if they actually acquired, they, they only overflew about once a month, but they didn't always acquire data every month at every, at every flyover. So sometimes you could, be, you could be looking at images that you only had once every six months or once a year. And the issue with SAR, with, with SAR radar data is that it decorrelates as the ground surface changes. So if the properties of the surface change, then the radar, then one, the, then one pixel doesn't look the same to the radar from one time step to the next. And so we get to correlation, which means that you lose pixels. That's what all the white is here. You lose pixels because of vegetation change. You lose, you lose pixels because of moisture changes on the ground. And again, the longer the time period, the more vegetation changes or the more likely, likely you are to have soil moisture changes or snow or rain and all of those other things that go into that decorrelation problem. Um, that lack of pixels also causes problems in things like unwrapping. You have to unwrap these images, as I mentioned. There's a whole series of, of errors that follow on from not having pixel coverage. So having these short time period repeat times has been really key. Reliable ones that you have all the time has been really key to the, possi to the possibility of being able to make time series out of these images, not just single two-step two passes. Again, differential INSAR, even over long time periods, can be very good at imaging large signals like an earthquake, but monitoring smaller signals, interseismic strain accumulation and creep, that's what we're looking at here on the left. This is the Hayward Fault in California. North is off to the right. Um, San Francisco and, and uh, Oakland are where you actually see green and blue pixels, but all those areas with the white, that's decorrelation that occurred because again, this was largely, this was largely done with the ERS and the NVSAT satellites, the RS satellites, 1992 to 2000. The European Space Agency put up a series of satellites called ERS one and two in that time period. So again, you have to have a lot of time, you have to have a time series analysis, you have to have more images over longer time periods, but then again, you have this problem with decorrelation. Sentinel-1 has changed all that. It's, it's an amazing data set to work with. It has, it has really completely changed how we look at and what we, how we look at and what we might be able to do with investigating these smaller motion events, these smaller motion processes. We get much better image coherence, but nothing, as I said, comes without a price. Worldwide coverage means we have these very large, ever-increasing numbers of images and a big data problem. So let's go back to that stack of interferometers. You want, you've got a five-year data set, say, at 12 and 24-day intervals. You want to make a time series out of all of those. That gives you more than 500 pairs and weeks worth of processing. More processing if you're lucky enough to have six-day intervals, or if you have a place where it's nice and dry and there's no vegetation, you can go out to say 36 day intervals. That's if you could, and, and to be honest with you, that's those weeks or if you just knew exactly what all the parameters were, were supposed to be in that processing. But for any of you who've done any sort of complicated um, um, remote sensing processing of any kind, you, all, you know it never works the first time. You know, you always have to tune the parameters and, and, and look at particular regions and there's a whole bunch of things that go into that. And so you could be looking at months to, to work out with that data set on your local machine. So your choice is, your choice really is to go with some kind of automated processing, something that's gonna speed this up. And I'm gonna show you three ideas here. The first is you can go with um, high performance computing, of, of differential insert pairs and time series that is updated automatically. This is something we're working on under an NSF computational infrastructure project. I'm gonna show you the results from that first here. You can um, turn it into container processing. Again, you can do that either on the HPC or on something like the AWS cloud. That's um, 
something we're looking at too. Also, agencies or institutes are, are thinking about producing standard products. NASA, JPL, and ASF have already partially implemented this under Sentinel-1 and are planning it for, in, for NISAR. And that, I'll be, that, um, that actually often uses a container I, uh, a container that they process on AWS, for example. So there's some overlap here between these three methods, but I'm, bas I'm gonna basically um, uh, break them down into those three examples here today. So there's one other wrinkle in this, just for the sort of in terms of the processing and the computational things you have to think about. There are other insert processing software, there are other insert processing software programs out there, but there are three big ones are the ones that we all use. Most of us, 90% of us in the community use. Narrowest follows. The first is ICE, the INSAR Scientific Computing Environment. Um, for those of you who have ever heard it before, it's the modern version of ROYPAC. ROYPAC was originally developed at, at JPL. Um, it's a very complicated program with a lot of um, uh, parameters you can change and tune. I think I mentioned that there are a fair number of parameters you need to tune to get some decent INSAR processing done. A lot of different subroutines you can choose from, things like unwrapping. Um, it's continual being updated and it, I'll be honest with you, it has limited documentation. Now that it's on GitHub, it has a, um, uh, and it's open, now it's open source on GitHub, which has happened relatively recently. There is, there, there's, there are, there's better documentation and the updating is done better. The updating of the documentation is done better, but it has historically been a bear to install. Um, better now than it used to be, uh, much simpler now than it used to be. Um, and, um, and again, support, as is often the case um, where, where, where um, research centers have to support ongoing software can lag some. GMC, GMT-SAR, this was developed at Scripps. Um, it is also open source. So like both of these one and two were effectively funded by NASA and NSF. Um, it is more prescriptive and it's less adaptable. So it's relatively basic. When I teach INSAR, differential INSAR processing, I use GMT-SAR. Um, it's got lots of tutorials. The documentation is better, uh, but it again, doesn't offer all the bells and whistles you can get with ICE, for example. Um, and then Gamma, which is a commercial software. It was developed by the same people who did the Bernese software for GPS processing out of, of Switzerland at the Institute in Bern. Um, it's a commercial company now. It's a commercial software, has great support. It's also very expensive to buy and very expensive to, 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 run, the up, to run the maintenance for. Um, I have a license for it, which I purchased when I came here because I had had licenses in Canada, which were, which were supported com for complicated reasons, were funded partially in large part by, the, by uh, government grants. Um, but uh, here I, I use it relatively limited in a relatively limited fashion um, because it's, I'll be honest with you, it's the, it's the cream of the crop, but it, um, it's expensive. And most of my students when they graduate will not use it because it's not supported. Because it's because NASA has funded these other two programs, it's not you cannot support it under a, a NASA or an NSF grant. So this is just an example of what you might get if you ran um, a whole bunch of images on your local machine and how much time it would take you. This is Western Greenland. This is an image of, of uplift, elastic response to ice sheet changes um, uh, near one of the great one of near one of the glaciers in on east in central eastern uh, Greenland. On the coast, there's a GPS station, KUAQ, Quack, which um, uh, was one of the, and another one, MIC2, which um, was one of the reasons we chose this location for some testing to see how they lined up, how the, how the uplift lined up with uplift we know is ongoing at those stations. Um, here I used almost 900 pairs processed sequentially on one local machine um, using Gamma software, in this case. Um, once the months went by, and it's a couple of months to process this on that machine, 900 pairs. Um, I then had to go through the images and try and choose about 100 optimal pairs to do the time series analysis. Again, because this is um, Greenland, there's a lot of snow and ice. A lot of the images um, were uh, corrupted by the snow and ice in the winter, the, the large snow and ice, that you, the amount of snow and ice you see in the winter. So again, a um, whole bunch of, a um, lot of time to produce this image. And as time goes by, more images are acquired. 
right? This is, this is an ongoing problem with this, an ongoing issue with this kind of analysis. By the time I get my two months of work done just to produce this, there are two months more of, more of images that are sitting in the queue waiting to be done. Just if you did that on your machines. If you um, wanted to go with agency standardized processing, I'm gonna show you an example here of um, what you might do. So both, both the Alaskan Satellite Facility and JPL, which has a project going ongoing called ARIA slash Opera, they have funding to um, produce, they have had funding and it's ongoing and it comes in chunks, but anyway, um, the to move forward in terms of doing automated processing um, for people who are not in our processors. There's gonna be all this data out there. There's gonna be all these people who are not technical experts, but they're gonna to wanna to use all this, all this, these INSAR images, these D INSAR images that you can get. And so that you can make yourself, but they're not gonna make those 900. So um, right now they're running a testing program in which um, jointly ASF and JPL have worked up this out where they process images for you. Um, you can go in and request them. You can re request 200 at a time if you get an account. You can request that they process those images for you and they'll process them using gamma. And there's some parameters you can opt for, like, do I want, um, what do I want for resolution on the ground? What do I want for DEM if I can get it? Those kinds of things. You put in your options, you put in an order and a couple of days later, you get 200 images um, a month. It's 200 a month. Um, I um, am on one of the committees that works with ASF, so I am allowed to ask for six for eight hundred a month. So between the end of September and the beginning of August last year, I acquired sixteen hundred images. Um, between March eighteenth and two thousand and August of twenty twenty one, they use again gamma, a, a containerized version of gamma. On I believe it's an AWS processing system. At least that's what it used to be unless they've changed it. Um, here they've used an 80 meter DEM, which is kind of the local DEM for Iceland. Um, and the resolutions here are, are 40 meters. I chose the highest resolution they'll offer, that they'll allow me to do. If I did this myself, I might do it at anything from 15 to 28 meters. But, so this is a kind of lower resolution result that I might do um, if I did it myself, but it came in a couple of days. Um, I took a look at those 1600 images. I asked myself, what are the best 317 images? Actually, I asked myself, what are the best images? I came up with 317 of them. I put them into a time series analysis estimate. It gave me the velocity in radians per year shown on the right. This is the radians per year in this particular case would be again about 2.8 centimeters again, for every radian here, 0 0.042891, sorry, the, um, the um, significant figures are lousy here, but about, again, about that much motion either away from or toward the satellite. Red is, positive is toward the satellite, so red is toward the satellite, so that's shortening on the, in the blue, the ground is moving away from the satellite in some fashion. Again, this is showing an eruption, that eruption down um, near Reykjavik on the uh, Reykjavik Peninsula in Iceland. You can see the decorrelation, interestingly, off to the north. That's largely, again, a function of ice and snow um, and and again, the sort of more bare earth um, products and processes that you have going on down in the Reykjavik Peninsula itself. And I've also given you a time series that, that, that ends just before the eruption. So this is, this is the motion of the ground caused by the injection of magma under the surface. It started as, as the ground started to rise and rise and rise to go up before the eruption. Once the eruption happened, of course, then all this lava comes out that A causes decorrelation. So there's some issues with doing, in, doing differential insert after that. But in addition, the ground will then start to subside. So if, we, if I continue this on, I should see a subsidence signal after, during and after the eruption throughout this time period. And this is just an example. 
of what someday people will be able to do using um, using products from NICAR that will be automatically processed. JPL's plan is to automatically process um, at about, a well, last I knew, about 90 meter resolution, every pair that's produced by NICAR. As it comes off the as it comes off the off the earth as it comes down from the, as it comes down from the satellite and then you'd go in and acquire these not process them yourself just download them and turn and then run your own time series time series analysis doesn't take that long that's not a big data problem necessarily it's an inversion problem which is a whole other issue but it's not a big data problem so locally we wanted to do stuff like this we wanted to be able to do our own processing locally, automated big data, so we could do time series and update those time series on a, on a regular basis. And we have a couple of different initiatives that are ongoing to do that locally here at CU. Sorry, I'm just checking my time, good. Um, and I'm gonna spend a little more time than anything else talking about this one, because it's ongoing. We call this the GeoSci Framework Project. It's a project that it actually is led out of UNAPCO, which is local here to Bowler, as many of you will know. Um, Chuck Mertens was the um, PI on it. and um, uh, it actually has a couple of different facets, um, but here at the University of Colorado and the University of Oregon, we're leading the two science sides of this. So the idea here is it takes the idea is to improve earthquake, tsunami, and volcano early warning using big data and machine learning methods. So the idea is you take your take your data and you you process it using largely streaming algorithms. University of Rutgers is, is the uh, computational science partner here, and that's the set of tools they want to use um, using streaming products, so, and then make those data products available again to the community along with algorithms, the research community, along with algorithms that they can run on it, algorithms like machine learning algorithms and inversion algorithms, modeling, modeling programs, et cetera. So all of that would be resident in this um, one um, um, structure, this this one um, interface, interface is the one I'm looking for, this one interface where people could go and access that data. And it might be INSAR data, it might be GPS data, it might be seismic data. There are a whole bunch of sensors that get put out in, um, to look for, to look at these kind of phenomena, with a quick tsunami and volcano. And, the idea would be able to let the research community access all that data and run their own models and draw their own conclusions. Um, there are largely two research phases. This one is to look at the earthquake tsunami side. So that's an early warning application run on the University of, of Oregon by a guy named, by a researcher, named, a professor named Diego Melgar. If you are interested in tsunamis, I recommend you go see his work. It's really awesome. Um, he's using GPS data to estimate tsunami height and um, run up basically um, after a large earthquake off the Cascadian coast. Um, our side of the house was is largely volcano and volcano early warning is really intermediate to early warning. Volcanoes, um, unlike tsunamis and earthquakes, you have, you have more than a couple of seconds, minutes and hours before the tsunami hits. Um, you have so often with volcanoes, days, weeks, and months of precursory activity that tells you something about what's going on underneath. So that's our side of the house is the volcano. And that's what I'm gonna show you here today. So the, we developed an automated differential INSAR processing routine that uh, we based at least originally on the, on the GMT SAR source code. Um, we take SLC, single look complex SAR data. We download it automatically from ASF. We generate interferograms automatically using the GMT SAR code. We do that on Summit. That's where we originally ran all the tests for this. Um, the next step in this project is to um, is to put it is to put it through the streaming algorithms that that the they're part of the infrastructure that the University of Oregon, sorry, the University of Rutgers is working on. Um, so we did, in, but for the test cases to show what we could do, we installed. A and we use those their HPC resources to process all interferometer grams at 12, 24, and 36 day intervals for Hawaii. In this case, what you're looking at here on the right is Hawaii. Um, we chose Hawaii. I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of talk about using other volcanoes for this work, um, Yellowstone, et cetera. And um, I, I kind of insisted on Hawaii because if in the end, Hawaii and places like Sierra, Sierra Negra are our best choices because we're actually going to look for things like 
we want to look for precursory signals using machine learning algorithms as well as models. We know a lot about the models, but you need you need training data for machine learning algorithms and Yellowstone has not erupted in a long time. And I think we're all pretty happy about that, just so we're clear. Um, and, but in terms of having a place where we could produce data and test those algorithms, it was not gonna be optimal. So we have been focusing on um, Hawaii here because Hawaii erupts on a regular basis. This on the right is the 2000 island and destroyed a lot of other parts of the island. Um, here, again, this is one unwrapped line of sight phase interferogram between April 23rd and June 4th of 2018. Again, warm colors here are positive that represent an increase in the slant range. So again, the ground is moving away from the satellite in the line of sight direction. It's a side looking radar. And so that is at an angle to the ground. Cool colors represent a decrease or something that's coming back toward the satellite. The um, volcano itself tends to, er the, the eruption location for, um, Hawaii, for the Big Island of Hawaii is on what's called Kilauea. This is Kilauea over here on the um, Eastern side of the island. And this is what's often called the um, Eastern Rift Zone. And that's why it's got that sort of long, narrow um, trending um, shape to it. Cause that's where, it's erupt that's where it erupts along the rift there. Um, again, 12, 24, and 36 day intervals in approximately 12 hours. That took us about 12 hours to do on summit. 250 descending images paired into 671 pairs. This is some work that was published by my, my postdoc at the time, Christina Kalevitz. Um, and um, here we remove the topography using a DEM, a high resolution DEM. We remove the orbits because the satellite agency provides us orbits, orbit locations. So we remove any kind of orbit errors might be in the, that might exist between the two different passes. And we remove an atmospheric signal using models largely. And I'll show you that in a minute. Again, we, uh, we, we're testing, processing this using ICE to see if we can do better, get some better results out of it um, at the moment. And one of, one of my students has been processing, it on, processing that on his local machine to test the ICE processing. It took him well over a month to process the same images. This took us about 12 hours. And it's set to automatically update. So you, you, know, so you run a batch job and every, time the, um, and every time a new image comes in, every six to 12 days when a new image comes in that matches this image into the, into the um, archive, we download it, we process it, and we update the time series automatically. And I'm gonna show you the time series here. So this is the second stage in the INSAR process. And this is much shorter, it doesn't take anywhere near as long a time as the interferograms. We use what's called the giant time series program um, to, to process this. It was again developed out of JPL a number of years ago. We applied a Geikos atmospheric correction to it. That's been produced by the University of Leeds in um, uh, Comet. It's a Comet group out of the University of Leeds in England. Um, they provide, provide us this at about the same resolutions, 90 meters or so as the INSAR itself. And we used a, a standard, what's commonly called NSBAS uh, time series, short, short baseline time series inversion method to do this. All of those details are not particularly important to you, but what you can see are the, are the slices, time series slices that you get as you do this. This is on the left, November 11th in 2015. You can see a little bit of odd uplift in May 4th of 2017 down by that Eastern rift zone. You can see that it starts to migrate and you get this, you get that same sort of um, uh, parallel motion as the ground comes up and it starts to spread apart in two different directions along that rift through May 5th, 6th and 12th here. You see uplift under the main um, crater as well. And then again, right before the, um, the eruption on April 13th, 13th, you see all this very strong um, signal of both, again, diking or spreading that is occurring over the rift zone and uplift over the main um, volcano crater. We integrated this with GNSS data. So this is a method that I haven't talked about um, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on. It's actually uh, an interesting data analysis um, technique. We, it was developed by one of my, one of my grad students then postdocs uh, more, than a, more than a decade ago, 15 years ago now, um, where you combine the GNSS data, which is point motion, 
with very high precision in a horizontal direction, but not very good vertical accuracy. The INSAR images do quite well in the vertical, but not as well in that, particularly in the north-south direction. We integrate those together and INSAR provides you a field of data, not single point um, um, locations. Um, you integrate them together in a, in a, within a statistical model um, and you produce outputs in this particular case at about hundred meter resolution. So what you've done is you now produce three dimensions of motion. That's hard to do with line of sight. Line of sight is one direction of motion. Um, and so DNSR does not give you very good three, does cannot give you three dimensions with just one set of images. You can now get by integrating them three dimensions because GPS has those three dimensions. You pin your motion to that. Um, you pin your directions to the GPS directions, and it'll help you improve your horizontal accuracy while you while the while the INSAR gives you good vertical accuracy. And so again, we put these together to get three cumulative displacement map, maps now, not just one line of sight, but three east, north, and up, with the same discretization and geocoding as the differential INSAR output. And that's what I'm showing here on the right for three different time steps again. This is, I'm going to pass on this because I'm not going to have enough time to get to the newer stuff that I wanted to show you if I do that. Um, this is, we just finished a paper on this. It's just been published. This will give you all the details on how Kilauea erupted using this particular set of data, which we're, we're really, really pleased with. But um, that's only if you're in, interested again in um, volcanic eruptions in Hawaii, per se. And this is just a comparison with the um, with the, one of the actual G, GNSS stations to um, to see how well the data matches at that one location. When you're done, it matches very well as it should. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a very good method. And we produce the nice thing about the Bayesian analysis is it produces a um, uh, an error map as well. That, which, and that not only helps you see the total errors, but you can actually parse out the errors that you're getting from both the GNSS. What's the portion of the errors that's coming from the GNSS versus the INSAR, which is also a big advantage as well. Again, implications here, 800 million people live globally within 100 kilometers of an active volcano. We can get 3D motions of the Earth's surface at better, better resolution, better constraints. Again, we've implemented a continuous scalable near real-time data streaming architecture such that we can combine these data sets and produce updates effectively once a week or once every two weeks, depending on how often those images come in. And these can be applied pretty much anywhere. Next steps, we're gonna create a synthetic data set with using volcanic source modeling and apply some machine learning applications in that same geoscience framework architecture. We are also in the middle of converting the GMT star to the ice container, I think I mentioned that already, and as is always the case with, in, with doing anything with differential INSAR, all programs turn archaic and disappear. So the, the original time series program that we use for this is no longer supported by JPL. The new one is called MintPy. So we're working on converting to that. Those are just things we're working on. You'll all be, I'm sure be sympathetic with that whole, the community moves on, and leaves things behind problem. But we have other projects are working on this kind of thing. So the, the idea of containerizing the differential insight processing, we started working on that a while ago. So this is slightly different from, the, from what we've implemented on the last, um, the last uh, example I showed you. We, uh, we uh, borrowed and we acquired an ice container from ASF freely available um, that was used on AWS. We modified it to run on Summit. And so I have a, we have a project with the NASA sea level team um, to look at subsidence in coastal cities as sea level comes up with, with climate change. And, um, but a lot of these cities along the coast, they're pumping out water, they're building on them, et cetera. So they have, a, they have a natural subsidence problem going on, an anthropogenic and natural subsidence going on in these deltas and coastal cities, deltaic and coastal cities, big cities, mega cities. And so as they're subsiding, and often in many cases, they're subsiding faster than sea level rise is happening. So this is, I'm gonna show you just a couple of examples of what we've done here. Again, this is Sentinel data using INS differential INSAR between March of 2018 and June of 2021. We used a 10 meter DEM to improve our pixel recovery and resolution. On the right is an interferogram at about 15 meter pixel spacing, showing just one snapshot of between June 30th and, and July 12th of 2020, just one snapshot of what's going on in the region. On the right 
is um, a velocity map for that for the entire time period produced using again that ice container modified for parallel processing here on summit by one of my students again we get several hundred um, images that can be processed in just a few hours and again you get this long-term subsidence map that's going on here we're still working at benchmarking this one of the problems with coastal cities is there's not usually a lot of of um, bedrock and as a result um, you need gps stations or some other way of estimating the local subsidence so you get an absolute map in Zara is a relative map. This is again Lake Coast, Nigeria. And again, you can produce individual time series from these, just as I did for Iceland. So again, you can see that if you pick a couple of different spots, you can see how it's subsiding with time, both a seasonal signal that you're seeing in some of these, as well as just the long-term secular subsidence rate as well. This is Vancouver, British Columbia. This is some work I did. I used almost 1,200 differential INSAR images produced again with that same container on Summit. I, I, collect, I uh, selected 310 optimal pairs and I did process a time series analysis on that. I used a five meter DEM and the final result is in about a seven meter pixel spacing. That's what's up here on the right. On the left is something we did 10 years ago, almost now using eight years ago now using ERS and radar set data, NVSAT and radar set data um, for the same region. And you can see the lack of pixels. You can see the loss of coherence in some of those locations that we got when we did that analysis on the left because those images were not produced at again, 12 day intervals. The one on the right, 12 and 24 day intervals. And this is what I get, July 2017 to July, 2021. Here I've converted the displacement to millimeters per year. And again, you can see that in some places, this, if you've ever driven through Vancouver, this is both a delta, this is the Fraser River Delta that's coming out down the bottom, plus there's large areas of agricultural fields. That's what those little square boxes are that you see as you drive up the highway, you can see them coming up there. Um, I'll show you some individual locations in a minute. Again, this is the city itself. Whoop, this is the city itself on the right. Um, that kind of a uh, Google Earth map that matches this. Again, you can see some of these um, uh, agricultural fields Again, over on the left, you can see the airport on the very left um, out at the end of the delta um, as well. Oh, you can see this weird subsidence going on down in the US as all can good Canadians would say, God only knows what's going down, on down there. Um, anyway, this is some of the locations. This is the airport, as I mentioned already. You can see this, rel this relatively consistent linear rate of subsidence between 2017 and 2021. Sorry, again, this is in millimeters per year. I foolishly did not put an axis on that. This is right along the edge of the Richmond seawall. On the inside of that sort of vertical line you see there, there's actually literally a seawall level there, seawall sea there. There's suburbs on the on to the east to the east of that, houses, city houses, and you know, uh, strip malls, all that kind of stuff. And on the left is literally the beach, the ocean, the water, the delta. Um, um, on the, in the southern area here, this is this is the landfill. This is the local Vancouver landfill, and you can see how much it is subsiding again pretty continuously over this time period. And out here in the mudflats, in some cases, we're actually seeing uplift. And I do not know what is causing that. That is something that I still have to spend some time, literally, going out there with with boots and um, and and a trowel and try and figure out what exactly is going on in some of these areas out on the mudflats themselves. So whether they're really a grading or whether we're seeing some kind of other odd behavior. It would be, it's unusual to see that kind of behavior in, um, in SAR. Future plans. This is a map on the, on the very right produced by um, the Geological Survey, Survey of Norway in which they, they are literally producing an ongoing map similar to that map that I talked about for um, the GeoSci Framework Project for say it in Hawaii, but for their entire country. So you can look for things like landslides, precursory motions, uh, subsidence, again, changes to the solid earth in Norway with time. Mike Willis and I have a newly awarded um, NSF Navigating New Arctic Project to do the same for the solid earth portions of Greenland. Again, to do an, a map that covers, again, using these same techniques I've talked about, the ice container, at high resolution, high resolution DEMs um, to look for everything from a time dependent map of crustal flexure in the bedrock areas of Greenland 
and to look at small scale phenomena such as landslides and permafrost change. Last summer, we had a Rhesus student work on this. He's coming back this summer to work on it again. We produced just a pilot project of, um, in, a, in a northwestern part of Greenland near one of the glaciers there that everybody's interested in with a, a GPS station on it, et cetera. Um, that's what, and the very right here I'm showing, I'm uh, very left here I'm showing you is the location in Greenland. Um, on the bottom is one single interferogram between the um, September 2nd of 2016 to September 14th of 2016, again, a 12 day repeat time, looking at the change in line of sight phase. In this case, he's converted it to meters to get a rate. But again, so that many meters over 12 days is what he's seeing. That's probably not correct, by the way, probably not getting 2.4 meters of, of height change. But on the right, again, we're still working on the final results from this, but on the right, you can actually see a map of that time series, again, relative to this point R, which he's highlighted with R here, the big R on the right, showing, and if you can look at it, you can see some really, what I'm, I'm less interested in the flexure problem, um, but I am, which is what we're going to benchmark with GPS, but I am interested in some of these very small scale features, which are going on in, for example, in some of the fjords and the, and the valleys and the channels here, which are almost certainly things like landslides and small scale geophysical solid earth processes that are going on in those areas. We have just been awarded a NASA cryosphere project, which is 3D time series of Alaska's glaciers using both differential and SAR pixel tracking in this case. We're gonna add that into the problem. This is a result of some work that Ryan Casoto and, and Sergei Samsonov did um, in Alaska last year. And um, again, we're gonna apply the same technique to all the glaciers in Alaska um, over this next three year time period. And so again, we're gonna produce a 3D map. Again, we have to use that same automated processing technique though to do it because there's no way to produce all those time series maps without it. And yeah, that kind of leaves me to the end. Little, just exactly 11.50, I'm sorry. It's right at the end of our time, but I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. Wants. All right, thank you so I'm much. I'm gonna Christy. bring up the chat too here in a minute. Yeah, Natasha put in a fairly long question in the chat <laughs> if you wanna answer that. Sure. Uh, let's see. I, I can read it too. Um, okay, sure. <laughs> you can do that too, Natasha. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So clearly SAR is quite complex to work with. Um, if we were interested in collaborating on the use of SAR, what are the types of applications of SAR that you're most interested in? And you showed volcanoes and sea level rise. Um, just to put this into context, many, many earth labbers focus on ecosystems, fire, and hydrology. Is there interest in collaborating on these kind of SAR applications? Sure. I talked a little bit about this one because it's kind of been kind of this big data problem we have going. But um, I have just finished a project. I and three other actually researchers, prime, senior researchers in, um, in ESOC have just closed out a project with NASA in which we, um, it was an IDS project in which we looked at cascading events Cascading events that are a function of wildfire, large fluvial events, and has and and uh, landslides. So how do you link those together? Ryan has been working on the landslide part of that, the landslide modeling part of that, and he's just finishing that up now. Um, and so for that, we use some SAR data. Um, for example, I, I need to send you a copy of it, Natasha, when I get off this. I haven't had time this morning to answer your email to me, but um, I. I had a student who's defending tomorrow who um, actually produced some wildfire um, burn maps in from what, for Western Colorado using SAR, using Sentinel-1 SAR data. Um, that's been done with radar stuff. Well, so I, I, I myself have, a, I have my own personal research largely tends to be earthquakes and volcanoes, although I have, but I have an interest in how we use SAR for natural hazards and all of my students have an interest in that. That's one of the reasons for the NSF navigating the New Arctic project because the bulk of my students who come in today are interested in natural hazards on, 
and the, their interaction with climate change. That tends to be a very big focus these days for, my, for our graduates, and so that's not just me, but the fact that I use this technique, which can be used to characterize those things, means I have a lot of students working on other kinds of things between besides earthquakes and volcanoes. So for example, Joel is working on the subsidence project and, and um, um, sea level rise. I have, um, a, a, I have a proposal to look at, to do that same thing, for example, for Bangladesh on a big scale. We, we just produced a map of, of subsidence in Bangladesh that um, I think will be, that we think could be improved radically with time as a master's project, but we think it'd be much, much, we can do a really good job with when we benchmark it to real data in Bangladesh. Um, I have had a flood project through NASA over the last few years, characterizing flood waters in, in Flood waters with time, as as the as for example, Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, and I could show you some examples of those. As Hurricane Harvey hit Houston, how how did um, can you map the flood waters better than, for example, we do with something like NDWI or Sentinel two, right? Because you're because you're actually acquiring SAR through the clouds and not um, and not you're not you're not hamper, hampered by that, and you. And you can do it nowadays at pretty high resolution, 15, 10 to 15 meters. So yes, I do have a lot of interest in that, wildfires, et cetera. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, so um, yeah, um, many of the differences were in millimeters. The height change is in is is off is in centimeters to millimeters, and and accuracy with INSAR, we we, we make the broad statement that we do it at millimeter to centimeter accuracy. It's that's true. It's a wide. It's an order of magnitude range, though. That's largely a function of the coherence. There are atmospheric errors as well, which we can screen out for. We work hard at screening out for. And um, again, that's one of the reasons. And but the other two sources of errors: one is atmospheric. Those can largely be accounted for or estimated reasonably well. Um, the other is this coherence change. So as, as the surface properties change on the ground, then um, then that affects your ability to properly image the, the pixel itself. And so you're and there are ways and there are ways to mitigate that as well. So it's one of these when I say I go through and of my 900 images, I come up with 317 I want to use. I do basically a, a, a coherence quality cut on that data. Um, and I only choose those images with the best coherence in order to minimize the errors that might be coming from loss of pixels. And that's the, that's the interferograms themselves. When you run them through a time series analysis, then you can then come up with an estimate of what the, what the error on that inversion is as a result in addition. So complicated process. It, there's a whole bunch of work being done at the moment trying to do a better job. At, for Literally for two decades, we have spent Three, almost three decades. We spent very little time on quantifying the error in INSAR because we didn't have enough data to do it with. Now we do. Now we have all this Sentinel data. Uh, do we have any questions from in the room in SEEG? It's just to speak. Yep. One question here. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Christy, uh, I'm wondering up, uh, here about the bands. Uh, mm -hmm. of those products and what do you think about the what uh, how NISAR can improve those things because they will have two different bands so, so can you talk yeah. a bit a little about this absolutely so I um so let's start with that I am one of those people that I love data I love combining data uh, to me you look at some data and you know what it's supposed to do and that's great. It's the things you didn't expect from data that I think are the coolest ones. So, so I actually can't wait for NICER because we're gonna have two different bands flying at the same time. And I know we're gonna get all kinds of cool stuff from that. Um, the way, the, the principles with, with the band, with, with SAR, in SAR in the bands is that we largely have historically with the X band, C band and L band. X band is the shortest wavelength, call it about one to two millimeters. C band is about five and five to six millimeters. That's what the range is approximately. Um, that's what we work with in, in, in the satellites. And then L band is 24 centimeters, approximately 24 centimeters. Um, and so as a result, they tend when you look at when you look at deformation, they tend to see different phenomena. L band, L band um, can can 
as you wrap and unwrap those fringes, it when, once the once the height change on the ground gets too big, it can't unwrap the fringes properly anymore. It, the surface doesn't look the same to it anymore, so you lose coherence. So L band does better with like big earthquakes and stuff. On the other hand, it also does better because it penetrates through vegetation better. C band doesn't do as good at penetrating through vegetation and sees smaller signals, but it also means that you can accrue small signals over time and do a time series quite well. It also, it sees smaller, it sees smaller phenomena better. L band does, isn't as accurate that way. And X band is used, it's a much, it, it, um, it has, it's used a lot for ice and snow processes. It's used for um, um, uh, vegetation canopy because it doesn't penetrate the vegetation canopy really at all. Um, but it also sees also, it's also very good at very high resolution data, very high resolution pixels. So they'll have their advantages and their disadvantages. S-band is gonna be in the middle. S-band is gonna be, it's gonna be about 14 centimeters. So it's gonna give us, Again, the L band on the NICER will give us good coverage, good coherence. We won't have as many vegetation problems as we do with the C band um, around the world. That'll be great. Um, uh, S band will give us a different, a different wavelength, a different phenomenon, and a, and a whole bunch of different things to learn. And it, it probably will be very good for um, other applications as well. It's one of the reasons it's being flown is because um, it, it, it should do quite well at characterizing changes in agricultural vegetation, agricultural processes. And the um, Indian Space Agency is de has developed that sensor and is, and is delivering it to be put on the satellite for that reason. They're very interesting agricultural processes across the Indian subcontinent. Um, um, and so, yeah, so at long or the short of it is I think that we'll see an, an entirely different, there'll be all kinds of new and interesting processes that come with it. On the interferometry side, there'll be one set. L-band, it turns out, is really good at looking at things like aquifers and aquifers in the fern and glaciers, like melted water inside those glaciers. That's something that they're probably going to get with that L-band satellite. There's going to be all kinds of exciting new applications we're going to do with this. Thank you. And, sorry. I'm always happy to talk about specific ones. Absolutely. Okay, when, it, and, and Natasha did ask this question. I guess I would like to say before we finish, be sure I say it out loud. We are always very interested in collaborating with people on the sort of um, big data applications, data analytics. Again, combining new sets of data, figuring out how to apply, to apply new methodology toward putting them together, like that Bayesian analysis I showed you earlier. Um, that's where we, you know that's where. And, and that's where largely we see a lot of the advances coming in the remote sensing world that we work in. We have a bunch of people that work with different data where we are, um, G GNSS data, ESAC has people working GNSS, we work with optical data um, uh, and a whole, and then some people do a lot of field work. We have a whole variety of sets of projects and, and, um, and skills that I think would be great to collaborate with all of you on, so yeah. Great, thank you so much again. Um, next week, we are having Nate uh, talking about uh, some of the Earth Data Science education. Um, and again, we're so happy to have you. Thank you again for- No, 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 um, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And, and feel free to, anybody wants to contact me independently, feel free to, I love to talk.